you don't know you don't know what you don't know and you're only going to know what you don't know once you find out what you what you don't know and then you'll know it Let that sink in. What you just heard was something we quickly learned on our journey. Follow us along for the next 18 minutes and let's find out together what it is that we don't know. But first, let us introduce ourselves. I'm studying IBM at the HFU Business School. My name is Katja, I study at HFU and I study BMP3, which is Business Management and Psychology. My name is Sven Bart, I'm 22 years old, I study IBW. What brought you here today? Um, I'm actually part of the course uh, Flying Classroom, which visits uh, different startup areas in Freiburg, in Karlsruhe and in Tel Aviv, which I'm very excited about. Why are you excited about that? Uh, so first of all, um, I think it's in general going to be very interesting to see if the, the whole startup environment is, is you know, going to be something I'm interested in or I'm interested to work in or have more contact in my, in my, in my later uh, like career. What is it you want to learn through visiting these different startups and ecosystems? Uh, I really want to, to know what a startup actually is, understand the complexity behind startups, um, but also understand the importance of ecosystems because I think it's important that startups interact and openly communicate within also, for example, in, in cities like Freiburg, Karlsruhe or, or, or Tel Aviv, where we're going to make interviews. For the first part of our journey, we wanted to find out what the startup scene in Germany looks like. For this, we went to Karlsruhe, specifically the Alte Schlachthof, an area of the city that houses many startups and innovative companies see what they are working on and what the German startup culture is like. We also believe that we will be getting the best answers to our questions by talking directly to entrepreneurs, because they will know best. As is the usual first step when trying to find out what something is, you could just Google it. A startup is a company that is in the first stage of operations. These companies are often initially bankrolled by their entrepreneurial founders as they attempt to capitalize on developing a product or service for which they believe there is a demand. Due to limited revenue or high costs, most of these small-scale operations are not sustainable in the long term without additional funding from venture capitalists. This is a pretty dry definition. Let's see how an actual entrepreneur would define it. I would define a startup with something that you probably can't define um, because every startup is also different but what they all have in common is that they move very fast, that they have to think on their feet. Um, it doesn't matter whether you have more people founding it, um, just one person, female, male, they all have to think on their feet. You have to adjust very quickly. like. You don't just follow down a road and then at some point you're like, um, I made a mistake, but you have to adjust along the way. So very fast thinker, adapting to what the industry or the clients throw at you. And I think that's what all startups have in common. Germany being a country where it's very popular to work at big corporations and climb the corporate ladder, we wanted to understand what drives entrepreneurs to take the risk of being self-employed. Maybe the strict protocol of 20,000 plus employees is not the, my thing to do. I liked it also at the university to have smaller groups of people, being more flexible, being doing something, getting the hands-on mentality. And I think that hands-on mentality is also something that um, at universities sometimes we are lacking. That is especially interesting for us as university students. But what other reasons are there that Germany is not known to be a startup nation? Um, I think, in, especially in the um, German-speaking market, or maybe like old, uh, the old world um, in Europe, you have still that part of um, jealousy. So there, there's two two ways um, that you don't want to be 
are uh, two positions that you don't want to be as an entrepreneur. And one is you don't want to be too successful because other people will just not be happy for you. Uh, you're just too successful. Um, and you don't want to fail because uh, if, you, if you have a startup uh, and you fail, you're done. It appears to be a really risky bet to start something in Germany, because you seem to only have one chance. But it's not like that everywhere. Maybe we should check out a different location and see how things are done there. Hello, what a coincidence. Good morning. Where are you heading? The airport. What? I'm going there too. <laughs> you look infinitely more ready for a flight than I do. Uh... Hey guys! Hey guys! Sasha, where are we going? Uh, I'm not sure. No, but we are going to the bus stop to take the bus to Stuttgart. It smells so nice. Oh yeah. And we're back at the airport. So we took the train, don't have any local currency and apparently you have to have local currency in order to take the bus. I mean, who would have thought of that? Right now, we're walking the last three kilometers from the train station to our oh, that Airbnb. Our bus. That's, that's our bus there. there. That would have been the 204 bus that we would have taken. So we're just gonna do a nice nightly walk. Is that a knock? I want it to be annoying. No. We made it! We <laughs> After we had all finally arrived in Tel Aviv, it was time to get to know the city and why it is such a popular place for startups. On our first day, we visited the offices of a company formerly known as NanoRep, which was acquired by LogMeIn, a US-based tech company. It was time for our first interview. Getting all the cameras and setup figured out was admittedly more complicated than we expected. But everything worked out in the end, and we got the chance to interview Amit Ben, the founder of NanoRap, who could give us some first valuable insights into the startup scene here in Tel Aviv. The reason there are so many startups in Israel is because of the culture and the mentality of the people in Israel. So a lot of us have this entrepreneurial uh, itch that makes us want to form a company. Uh, it's something in our culture that is really pro-risk and kind of insensitive, less sensitive to risk. A lot of other cultures are very risk adverse. And if somebody fails in a business, it's a very, very big deal. Here, if you start a company, start a startup and it fails, nobody, nobody cares because most of your friends probably did that also. So it's not Tel Aviv being a great place for startups and that's why people form startups here. It's because people form startups here and ended up being a great place for startups. Next on our list was the Tagalit Innovation Center. And we used the best means of transportation to get there. Technology, innovations, and startups. Israeli creativity is all around us, and it has made a huge impact on the world as we know it today. But how can such a small country, smaller than the state of New Jersey, play such a major role in the technological revolution of our time? What is the origin of Israeli innovation? 
That is an excellent question, but before we go on to that, let's recap some of the things we've learned today. First, the culture in Israel is different, pushing more people towards an entrepreneurial career. Second, compared to Germany, failure is not seen as a bad thing. Especially the point about failure was interesting to us. So we asked Tamar, who is currently in the early stages of her startup, she gave us a great answer. You absolutely need to fail, you need to feel the failure and live through it in order to be able to move on and and get to where you want to be. As we heard from Amid earlier, the acceptance of failure is only one part of the bigger picture, which is the whole culture here in Israel. What else makes it so welcoming for startups? I think it's a combination of a few factors. I do think that there is a... Um, Israelis, not only are they less risk averse than many other cultures, um, they actually, I think that they're not socialized. This, this creates a very obnoxious society for an entrepreneur that's a really great that's a really great uh, characteristic you know you're 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 happy to do what you want you don't need the the feedback of other people you don't need everybody's approval you're, you you know you can just sort of uh, do it and there's also yeah the, the chutzpah of like you know if I come up with a good idea I might say to myself oh I'm sure somebody else has thought of this I'm sure there's t plenty of reasons why I wouldn't work in there plenty of Israelis who like come up with a great idea like that oh, I'm sure I can do it better than everybody else and so and uh, sometimes they do which is kind of uh, amazing and uh, and also you know we know from uh, from a lot of different um, studies we actually know that di the more the greater diversity you have in a workforce um, the better they do Mm -hmm. um, so even though sometimes Israeli startups can be somewhat homogenous, Israeli society as a whole is mm -hmm. a very diverse fabric to it. So you've got people who came from all different cultures, all different backgrounds, all different you know hometown, and they they are all maybe Israel you know they might all be second generation Israelis, but they come with a, a cultural backdrop and a way of looking at the world, which is it's quite different. So let's recap that quickly. Here in Israel, failure is accepted, risk aversion is generally lower, Israelis have a will-do attitude, they are also very confident in their abilities, which is something that is called the chutzpah, and they have a very diverse workforce. All these reasons are part of the story why Israel is doing so well in fostering startups. The following day, we went to the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation, which helped us put together all the things we had heard in the previous days. Take a look. Can you give me some ideas why you think this country's been so creative when it comes to innovation? From what we've heard, the army plays a yeah, yeah, the army, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So since they learned leadership and yeah. you know taking over important roles, yeah, and, the, the military yeah. has been important. They focused on cyber in particular, especially that also um, computer scientists, and, and they have um, a very flat hierarchical system, relatively flat, not completely flat, obviously, uh, but relatively flat compared to other countries where the youngest can challenge the oldest, and that's very, very important here. Which also stimul simulates a bit uh, the system, how startups work, yes. because and it makes probably young people not want to go into the classical corporation, yes. so they do not want that kind of flat hierarchy. Yes, that's true, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and that's a good answer. Risk awareness is pretty low yes, here. Yes, that's true. There's a, definitely a, a, a very healthy, maybe a little bit too healthy attitude to risk here. A very optimistic place. Um, so that's very, very good. An idea um, that Shimon Peres wanted to have for visitors from abroad to get an uh, idea about the whole of the Israeli innovation ecosystem, but also for Israel's young people as well, because um, you know, we believe on that list of innovators, there's not enough uh, girls on that list of innovators, not enough Israeli Arabs on that list of innovators, not enough people from Israel's Haredi community, which is Israel's Orthodox community. So one of the purposes of this place is um, to encourage them to think about creativity, to try and encourage them to think about innovation, to try and encourage them to think about entrepreneurship, so that they too can become part of this startup nation. For our last interview, we talked to Samuel Shear, a startup coach and innovation consultant. He has worked in this area for many years, and he gave us some deeper insights into why the startup culture is so different between Europe and Israel. In, if you think about it, the average, for example, Israeli founder is about 36. He's a graduate of one of the universities. He's worked in industry for several years. He has military experience, both in leadership and ten technical competence. So the various, the, the, the level of incompetence that smaller. he has in relation to his business idea is, you could say, 
it's still big, but it's relatively smaller than what you look when you look at Europe, where I see a lot of entrepreneurship happening, is around university campuses, um, meaning that you have people who have no real leadership experience, they don't have really technical experience, and in Europe we've sort of come to the conclusion that train, more training means more competence, means better companies and more innovation. And in Israel, actually, the conclusion is different. The conclusion here is, let's provide capital and trust that people will figure out things as they go along. After we had left Tel Aviv and arrived back in Germany, we went back into the ecosystem of our university and met with Professor Kerner, who is an expert in the field of innovation. She also offered us the possibility to explore the innovation center of our university, the IFC, to get a better understanding of how startups work in Germany. Germany is not known for a high startup dynamic. And it's not True. necessarily because Germany is not innovative, it's because in Germany traditionally innovation has not happened as a startup necessarily because mm -hmm. there was enough of an opportunity to do innovation inside a company. Economically speaking, that's not less effective mm -hmm. because it's less risk for the people. Um, they don't have to seek legal advice independently. They already have a legal department. They only have a financing department. They have a lot of knowledge in-house, HR knowledge and the rest of it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The problem is that the structures are usually too rigid to allow that for ha to happen, but that's another discussion. Of course, it would be good to have a higher startup activity, but we have to be careful about what we are pushing because it's not our strength what we might want to mimic. <laughs> so, you know, this inferiority complex thing is a, is a problematic attitude. So we, we have a class, an inferiority complex compared to the US, they have more venture capital, they have from other people, you know, Silicon Valley is fantastic, How let's do it here. So Germany is not very strong in B2C generally, but it hasn't, hasn't been. Mm -hmm. So the big consumer, what you and I as people are aware of, is not what Germany lives of. Germany's most economic area is not Berlin. Yeah. It's the hippest, but it's not relevant for the German economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, there is a discrepancy in perception and reality. We have to figure out how to go with the time, but this is not a lost competence. We don't have to become a B2C service economy overnight to survive. I don't see that danger. <laughs> Visiting these vastly different ecosystems in Israel and in Germany has been a great experience. It seems as while startups are super interesting and can be a driver for the economy, there are valid reasons why Germany is not a startup nation and may never become one. The strengths of this economy lie in different areas. There is of course much that Germany can still learn from Israel, but there is also much that Israel can still learn from Germany. It remains to be seen what happens to these developments in the future. Looking back, this course was a bit like a startup. It was the first time this was done at a university. There was a lot of uncertainty along the way, as there was no clear path laid out beforehand, and we had to adapt to new developments quickly. We definitely learned a lot, and we hope that you did too.